Hello everyone, I am Avisha Peters from Department of Psychology, BSS College and today we will be covering Introduction to Psychology, its concepts, origin and current status. The topics that we will cover in this video are, what is psychology, the roots of psychology, the birth of modern psychology, the pioneers of psychology and finally psychology in Indian context. Now moving on to our first topic, what is psychology? Psychology is currently a very new subject, a very new domain in India, but is, has its roots in our historic times, which we will cover in the oncoming slides. But for now, let us look at how psychology is defined. Psychology is the scientific study of the mind and behavior according to the American Psychological Association. What is mind? You can define it as your cognitive processes, what you think, your thoughts, that constitutes your mind. Your behavior, basically how you act, how you behave, it's observable behavior, which is what psychologists and researchers measure in the psychological test. It is a very multifaceted field, whether it be military sciences, it be organizational behavior, industries, or even your medical sciences. Psychology has its use anywhere. Now moving on to the next topic, that is the historic uh, roots of psychology. Psychology is really a very new subject. It's a new science. And the most advances that has been done has, is in the last century and in the current ongoing century. But the history, the roots of psychology goes deep into philosophy, which is one of the oldest subjects in the world. In fact, even ancient Indian texts such as Upanishads, your Puran, and your text about yoga such as uh, Patanjali, it all covers uh, uh, some aspects of the study of mind. Now let's look at the roots of psychology in the western context. We'll check out who Plato is. Plato is famously known as the teacher of Aristotle, who was in turn teacher of Alexander the Great. Plato was among the first people who used the word psyche and he used it to describe both the mind and the soul of an individual. He also developed a very rough framework of human behavior. Uh, stating that human behavior is driven by reasoning and impulses. Next, we have Aristotle, who as I previously mentioned, is the teacher of uh, uh, Alexander the Great. His uh, approach to psychology was quite similar to his teacher himself, but he added more onto the field uh, by proposing that the first entelechy, or the primary reason for the existence and functioning of the body is your mind itself. Now finally, we come to the main figures of psychology, that is Hippocrates. Hippocrates is usually more known in the field of medicine. Doctors, when they don their, uh, their coat for the first time, they take the Hippocrates oath. But Hippocrates has also uh, done significant contribution in the field of psychology. He was in fact one of the first people who theorized the personality traits under four categories. The first is melancholic. People who are melancholic, they tend to have traits of an uh, anxiousness, uh, they worry often, they often show depressive symptoms such as hopelessness, unhappiness, but they are also on the contrary, they also tend to be serious and thoughtful. Next we have choleric. People who are choleric tend to be excitable, they also tend to be uh, egocentric, exhibitionist. Exhibitionists are basically people who seek validation and attention from others. They also tend to be impulsive, histronic. Histronic basically means, again, it's a very attention seeking behavior. In fact, there is a personality disorder in DSM-5, which is known as histronic personality disorder. And lastly, they are also very active people. Next, we have sanguine people. Sanguine people tend to be playful, easygoing, sociable, carefree hopeful and contented, all the personality traits that you'll want to have in yourself. Next, we have philomatic. Uh, These people are reasonable, they are principled, they are controlled, they are persistent, they are steadfast, and they are also calm. All these four uh, personality categories, he, Hippocrates related them with the four fluids or humors of the body. Your black bile, your yellow bile, your blood, and finally your felgum. Next we come to the next important figure in psychology and that is Galen. Galen proposed that the seat of mind or where your soul exists is in the penile gland of the 
brain. Now of course, in the present times we know that pineal gland has really very little to do with the cognitive processes. It is a part of the whole cognitive processes that the brain does and pineal gland is mainly uh, concerned with your sleeping, uh, uh, sleeping functions of your body. Next we come on to the birth of modern psychology. So finally, it is around the 18th century where we start to see uh, psychology as a subject being separated from the field of philosophy. Otherwise, psychology was often considered as just a part of philosophy. William Bette is a, a big name in psychology and he was the one who proposed that people who suffer from uh, mental illnesses should be treated with kindness. In his treatise on madness, which was published in 1758, he proposed that, uh, that patients of mental illness, they should be treated with optimism and with kindness. Furthermore, we also have Hermann, uh, Hermann von Helmholtz. Uh, he was among the first people who conducted experiments in psychology. He is very known for his experiments in concepts of vision, hearing and so forth. And finally, we have Wilhelm Wundt who is known as the father of experimental psychology. He uh, established the first modern lab, psychology lab in 1879. And from then on, psychology never looked back as a subject as has continued evolving on. Now we come to the man himself, Wilhelm Wundt. Wilhelm Maximilian Wundt, he is known as the father of experimental psychology and his students, one of whom is Edward Tickner, was the founder of structuralism. Structuralism is a perspective that studies the structure of the mind through the two techniques used as introspection where each and every experience that you have felt is analyzed and questioned. Next we have none other than Sigmund Freud. Even people who are not aware of psychology as much, they know who Sigmund Freud is because of his huge popularity in, uh, among the masses. Sigmund Freud was an Austrian neurologist and he is known as the father of modern psychology. He is very famous for his theory of psychoanalysis. In fact, uh, when we first think of a therapist or counselling, the image that comes to our mind is a man laying down on a couch and a, a person in a white coat sitting besides him, besides him and taking notes on his notepad. That technique was invented by Sigmund Freud himself. He is although a very controversial figure in psychology due to the explicit nature of his ideas such as Oedipus complex. Now when we move on to what uh, some of the main findings of Sigmund Freud. Sigmund Freud had given a model of the mind in which he said that mind is uh, basically divided into three categories. Your, un your conscious, conscious is where you are still aware of what is going on around yourself. These are thoughts desires, feelings that you have access to. Then comes the pre-conscious. Pre-conscious is something where you do not have active access to, but if you think hard enough, you will be able to remember it. Finally, we come to unconsciousness, which as you can see in this iceberg model is beneath the water. This is where you do not have any access to. Unconscious basically considers of your childhood, uh, uh, childhood memories, your traumas, your desires that are perhaps uh, too anxiety ridden which is why they can't come to the surface and so forth. Now along with this Freud also uh, talked about three aspects of the human mind, ego, superego and id. Ego works on the reality principle. Um, how do I explain this? For example, if you all must have uh, watched the cartoon Tom and Jerry. You must have seen that whenever Tom is in a moral dilemma, one devil and one angel here will sprout up. As you can see, this is the angel and this is the devil. So the ego, the reality principle is Tom himself who is stuck in the middle. And next comes your super ego, that is your moral principle, the angel on your shoulder which will tell you to do the right thing. But then there is also the devil, the id, the pleasure principle. It will tell you to follow your heart, follow your desires, do whatever you want, don't care about others. 
and that is pretty much it about Sigmund Freud although there is much to study from but this is sufficient enough for your introduction to psychology. Next we move on to John B. Watson. John B. Watson, he was a strong uh, opponent to Sigmund Freud's uh, psychoanalyst theory because Watson believed that unconscious is not something that we can observe or study, it is not something that is scientific, whereas behavior is something that we can observe and measure. So often John B. Watson's theory is known as behaviorism. He is especially remembered for his research on the conditioning process. In fact, he had conducted a very famous experiment on a child uh, named Albert. The experiment know, is known as Little Albert Experiment in which he demonstrated that if you condition the child to fear a, even a neutral stimulus, the child will develop that fear if we associate that neutral stimulus with a fear provoking stimulus. So what uh, Watson used to do is he would show this little Albert a small cute white hamster but then immediately, immediately when ha uh, little Albert would try to reach out for this hamster, Watson would make a loud noise which would scare the child. After number of repetitions, finally what happened was that the child developed a fear of not only white hamsters but basically any small animal that is white in color. So here is concepts from behaviorism, the first one is operant conditioning where subject learns behavior by associating with consequences, it is very simple to understand, you are most likely to do behavior which rewards you, you got good marks in an exam, your parents reward you, you are more likely to study harder for the next exam as well so you can get a reward. Classical condition is what basically little Albert's experiment uh, is a good example of that where a subject learned to associate a unrelated stimuli with a another stimuli. For example, white hamster and loud noise as such have no association with each other. But Watson through classical conditioning was able to make a association uh, with each other uh, which is why the child developed a fear against white animals. Next moving on is Carl Rogers, Carl Rogers he came along and he said that I do not agree neither with psychoanalysis, I do not agree with behaviorism also. Both of these do not focus on the person itself, it focuses on the symptoms, on the problem. So he uh, came forth with his approach known as humanism or humanistic perspective. He is also known for developing the psychotherapy method called as client centered therapy or person centered therapy in which he proposed that we can treat or counsel uh, mental conditions with the help of uh, traits such as empathy, uh, openness to change and uh, he also further stated that each human being has the desire to be their best to reach their self actualization and the psychologist or the counsellor can help the client in reaching that. So here it is some concepts from humanistic psychology that you should know. The first is incongruence. So you basically have a perceived self, perceived self is basically your real self, how you actually are right now and then there is your ideal self, what you basically want to be. Both of these uh, self, if they are di completely different from each other, there will be a conflict. After all, uh, for example, let us say you want to have good marks in exam, but you are not able to have good exams in reality. Of course, this will cause anxiety and conflict within you. And this phenomena is known as incongruence, where you are not in harmony with yourself. Next comes congruence, where your perceived self and your ideal self are overlapping. They both are in harmony with each other. So the, here the chances of having a conflict is far less and the goal of client centered therapy is to promote this congruence within the client. Next finally we come to psychology in Indian context, often students of psychology or even from the, outs uh, the outsiders believe that India did not have much to contribute in this field, that psychology is mostly a western field which is completely wrong. Psychology even though the name did not exist in ancient India but there are plenty of texts and there are plenty of pioneers in this field who have contributed a lot to Indian psychology. One of them being Dr. Narendra Nath Sen Gupta, he founded the subject in 1950 
in Calcutta University and he was also uh, known to uh, find, found the first psychological lab. Now the key Indian figures, the first one is Durganand Sinha. He is known to make significant contributions in Indian psychological research. And then is Girishwar Mishra. He in fact uh, is uh, known for being a very famous social scientist. He is also a very famous psychologist and has written several books on statistics. In fact, his proverbs in statistics is world known. Next is Mrs. Anuja Trehan Kapoor. She is a very famous criminal psychologist and also a social activist. Now, what's criminal psychology? It's the formal name is actually forensic psychology. There are plenty of institutions in India which offer a master's in forensic psychology as a subject. It basically is concerned with studying the behavior of criminals and basically what goes behind a criminal's mind for them to commit such heinous acts. Next is Sri Aurobindo, who is a spiritual teacher, but his writings have had immense impact on the field of transpersonal psychology, which is more concerned with the existentialism of the human life. Next comes finally, what Indian psychology has to offer to the world. The first is of course mental health. Indian psychology provides a very holistic approach to understanding and treatment of mental health issues. For example, yoga is very one holistic lifestyle. Not only does it focus on your physical health, but it also focuses on your mental health and your concentration capabilities by practices such as meditation and mindfulness. Next comes spirituality. The ultimate goal of Indian psychology is essentially to achieve spiritual enlightenment or what is called as moksha or nirvana through self-realization. Next is education. Indian psychology emphasizes the importance of character development, self-awareness and self-regulation. In India, we used to have the culture of Gurukul where not only was the focus on academics but also was on mental health and uh, also on sharpening your senses. I am sure you must uh, recall that story of Arjuna and Drona, where Drona had repeatedly asked Arjuna, Ki, what are you aiming at? And each time Arjuna said, I am aiming only for the eye of the bird. It shows that in ancient India, teachers not only focused on the bookish knowledge, but they also focused on practical, educational and uh, pragmatic knowledge. Next finally comes organizational behavior. Organizational behavior basically means how human beings behave in an organization or in a group. It studies that. So Indian psychology, it can be used to promote teamwork, collaboration and effective communication. I hope you now have a better understanding of psychology and with this I sign off. Thank you.